Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Investing with IBD sponsored by Marketsmith. Today is August 26th, 2020. I'm your host, Arusha Pierce, and today we have Jay Jacobs on the show. Jay is the Senior Vice President and Head of Research and Strategy at Global X Funds. Thanks for being here, Jay. Thanks for having me. On today's podcast, we are going to talk about the current markets. We will talk about ETF investment themes, and we will end the episode with a few current ideas. So let's get right into the current market. And the market is in a really strong uptrend. Uh, today was yet another surprising day where a lot of growth stocks were just going through the roof. Uh, we have three distribution days on the NASDAQ, only one on the S&P 500. Jay, what are your thoughts about this market? Well, it's been an incredible growth rally since uh, since the depths of, of March and April. I think there's no question about that. But it's it's not being felt by every company. We've seen a huge divergence yeah. between growth and value stocks. Maybe that's come back a little bit in the last month or so. But the reality is we're in a very new economy. Uh, this is not the economy that we were in in December 2019. We are in a stay-at-home economy, and now we're transitioning into a reopening economy. And there's a lot of differences. 26 retailers have gone out of business during that time. There's been 15 million ongoing uninsurance, uh, unemployment insurance claims in the United States. You've had changing consumer habits and preferences as people get used to staying at home and ordering things online and entertaining themselves from their couch and, and being socially distant. So we're entering into an un, un, uncharted territory. This isn't where we were before. This is a new place. And there's a lot of companies that have really stood to benefit from that. Some of them are these very growth-oriented technology companies involved in you know, cloud computing, as we're seeing today with Salesforce, or video games, or e-commerce. And it's leaving behind some of the old economy names in the brick-and-mortar space and the travel space, where just the physical world is becoming a little less relevant uh, in today's economy. Yeah, it almost seems like this was a future that we saw maybe five, ten years from now, but it's all kind of happened in the last five months. Uh, how, how do you think the the economy is going to adapt once we get back to kind of normal, I guess, situations? And maybe more of a hybrid. Maybe we're not going to have the the forty hour work week uh, at the office. Maybe it's more uh, maybe sometimes at home, sometimes or maybe I guess just the like work life balance and the the work flexibility schedules will be a little bit more. What what are your thoughts on that? A lot of things are going to be different. This isn't normal. This is the new normal. So yeah. we're getting used to this as, as we go along. I think the reality is, that, you know, the, the key to the reopening economy is going to be flexibility and safety. So flexibility is on a dime, things could change. We could see a reemergence of COVID cases in a specific city or region, and people have to adapt. That means maybe you're going into the office for a week and suddenly you're back home for a month. Uh, that might mean stores were open. Now they're not. Restaurants were open. Maybe not. So things are going to be very dynamic, and any company that helps facilitate that flexibility, we think, is going to be doing very well in this environment. And then in terms of security um, and, and safety, uh, it, it's how do you protect people in this environment? How do you make sure that if there is an outbreak, that it can be detected very quickly and, and stopped very quickly? How do you test for that? How do you measure for that using different devices? How do you put in fail-safes that you know, if someone does have COVID that isn't detected, that it doesn't spread uh, exponentially through, uh, you know, through a, a geography. So, you know, those are kind of the two areas that we're looking at, the flexibility and the safety. If you can nail those two parts, then maybe you can reopen the economy in a big way um, and bring people back to normal. Uh, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing some, uh, some companies try that now at a very big level. We're seeing, you know, the NBA and the MLB try to do that. They're doing yeah massive testing on a recurring basis to see, you know, do it, does anybody with these teams have COVID? Is it, is it being spread? Uh, if it does happen, they're immediately shutting down games. So, you know, the sports world, I think is in a lot of ways, a microcosm for the bigger world as these companies try to figure out how do we get back to business uh, in a safe and flexible way. No, that, that's a really good point. Uh, Jay, why don't you walk us through how you got into this industry and how you ended up at uh, Global X? Sure. Well, uh, I, I started in the industry at the New York Stock Exchange about 10 years ago, uh, right after right after graduation. Uh, there was the, the New York Stock Exchange is at the center of, of the financial universe. And, you know, they they work with 
all different companies that are listing, trading companies, ETF issuers, you know, really the, the whole ecosystem kind of surrounds the, the uh, New York Stock Exchange. And it was a great place to learn. I was placed in the ETF group uh, at the New York Stock Exchange. So I was working with, you know, 50 different ETF companies, listing hundreds of products on the New York Stock Exchange. And it gave me just a great introduction into what is an ETF and why is it such a valuable vehicle? And this was back in, you know, 2011 when you yeah know, this was pretty new at that point right where i mean there was only i mean people i, I guess there's just the mainstream was a look, getting a little bit more used to etfs maybe you were we were trading the 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 larger index etfs but uh we, we it wasn't we weren't having a lot of those thematic etfs just yet right no it was still early on in the etf days and if you look at it in terms of assets under management it was you know almost four trillion dollars ago for a five trillion dollar oh. industry so a lot of the emergence of etfs has really happened in the last 10 years or so uh, i i think uh, a lot of it was frankly luck being in the right place at the right time uh, but it was a great place to learn and, and global x was one of my clients when i was at the new york stock exchange so i saw what global x was doing i saw what they were working on I knew there were some really exciting products coming out, and uh, the more I learned about the company, the more I just wanted to be involved in in the firm. Uh, so I so I joined Global X in 2013. Uh, at the time, there was eight people. Uh, we were still a, a pretty scrappy startup, um, but I think there was a lot of good ideas. We knew that people around the investment community needed income because interest rates in 2013 were still incredibly low, and uh, and we knew people needed growth that people were worried about, you know, where's the next decade or next, next multiple decades of growth going to be coming from. So, you know, since I joined Global X, we've been very focused on those two themes, finding high income and finding high growth for investors. And, and why do you think that the, the environment was ripe for these thematic ETFs to really kind of explode? Well, what we're increasingly seeing is the world is getting a little more nuanced, right? I mean, we, it used to be people would use sectors to express right. opinions on different parts of the market. You know, we think oil prices are going to go up, so we're going to buy energy. Or we think more people are going to be using technology, so we're going to buy technology. Or maybe we want to get defensive and we think rates are going down, so we'll buy utilities. But it turns out that's a little bit too simplistic because we see the rise of all these industries that aren't really fully captured by traditional sector classifications. Think of the rise of fintech. You know, you know, now with COVID, nobody wants to touch a credit card machine, so everyone's you yeah. know in their their watch or their uh, their phone on a on a contactless payments uh, um, point of sale system. Is it a financial company or is it a technology company? You see them classified as both sometimes. Mm-hmm. Is a robotics company that builds a robot that does surgery a technology company, an industrials company, or a healthcare company? So a lot of these definitions just don't make a ton of sense for some of the most powerful uh, parts of the economy right now and some of the new, most incredible growth stories. So we felt like there really needed to be a new way to define these companies, a whole new system for thinking about what are these high growth aspects of the market and how do we classify companies that should fit into these high growth aspects. So suddenly when you see a robotics company, we don't care if it's a healthcare company or an industrials company or a technology company. We don't care if it's in Japan. We don't care if it's in the U.S. We don't care if it's in Europe. Whatever happens, you know, it's going to be a robotics company in our robotics thematic ETF. No, and and that does make a lot of sense uh, because a lot of people w- w- could be exposed to robotics pretty early on and say, "Hey, this is going to be a really grow- growing trend." But before, it was really hard to invest in it. Now you can find an ETF that's heavily focused on that and, and, and profit when that time uh, comes. That's exactly right. I mean, I think a lot of investors, you know, read about these trends. They're, they're reading about robotics and the impact that it has on the global economy and supply chains and labor. And maybe, you know, a lot of investors are working in robotics. They're at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence and developing, um, uh, developing you know, new, new machinery and, and new mechanical engineering ideas that can make robots, you know, more, more capable than ever before, but it, it isn't that easy to invest in. I mean, if you're if you're starting from that perspective of what's a robotics company, you know, you have to have a global research platform to identify these companies all over the world that are leading in robotics. I mean, in robotics in particular, seventy percent of our ETF is outside the United States. That's just a function of how the robotics industry is today. There's a lot of Japanese companies. There's a few European companies in the space. So if you are a retail investor interested in robotics, it's it's pretty hard to identify those companies overseas. And even if you do, do you have the ability 
and the capability to be trading those securities right. efficiently. Right. So we think an ETF is just a great structure for providing exposure to those names because, you know, effectively we're doing the research to identify those companies or we're working with an index provider to identify those companies and we're doing the trading and we're packaging it all up into a single fund so that an investor can just, you know, buy one ticker and they get that exposure to the global robotics industry. And and what about like we, what we've seen over like the last five, 10 years is more and more investors are, are becoming more passive investors. How, how has that affected your business? Well, we 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 only do passive uh, ETFs with the exception of, of one of our funds. So, okay. you know, I think there's a few trends that are really happening behind the scenes. And, and first of all, um, ETFs are just a very efficient structure. They tend to be lower fee. They tend to be more tax efficient. They don't pay a lot of capital gains out and they're transparent. And so a lot of investors just like that, you know, those aspects of ETFs versus, you know, kind of the older technology, which is mutual funds. Uh, And then on top of that, you know, you really see how people are changing the way that they manage portfolios uh, because ETFs are starting to proliferate. So, you know, just go back 20 years ago, if you were a retail investor and you wanted international diversification in your portfolio, you probably bought IBM. You bought a U.S.-based conglomerate that had exposure yeah. globally, right? That right. was diversification. Now, with one trade, you can buy 2,500 companies in an ETF all over the world. So it's completely changed the way people think about portfolio construction because you can start thinking about, you know, how do I want to weight U.S. versus developed versus emerging? Do I want to overweight individual countries? Uh, do I want to get different ex- sector exposures or thematic exposures or currency exposures? All of that has become so much easier within the ETF structure. And this migration to passive investing, I think, is really a reflection of all of that, using the ETF structure effectively, uh, not just because it's lower cost and transparent and tax efficient, but because it's a really great way of, of, of doing kind of building blocks within a portfolio. Oh, perfect. So the market continues to be in a strong uptrend, but remember, manage your risk and let the market and leading stocks tell you when this trend is over. Let's take a quick break. But when we return, we are going to talk about a number of trends and ETF themes that are going on in the world today. We'll be back. I am here with Scott St. Clair. Scott's one of our senior product coaches at MarketSmith. Now, Scott, there are a ton of publicly traded stocks just on the U.S. I think it's over 5,000 stocks. Who has the time to go through all of these stocks and find the very best ones? Yeah, most people don't, right? So what you need is a tool like MarketSmith. We have decades of research on what makes a great winning stock. So we've done all the research for you. So we're going to try to highlight those specific stocks with those great data points. So if you're looking for that next great potential big winner, orange stock ideas button, you just click on it and you've got some of the main reports that we use, including the Growth 250. Yeah. And the Growth 250 is the first list that I go through on the weekends. Yeah. It's the most popular one, but there are others. There's the Breaking Out Today, Stocks Near a Pivot, and then the Blue Dot List, right, which is very popular. It's going to show you the stocks with the best relative strength. So we've done a lot of the work for you. What you have to do is review these lists. You're going to come up with some of the best ideas in that current market environment. Perfect. Mark Smith saves you time and makes investment research that much easier. For more information, go to Investors.com slash podcast 2020. Jay Jacobs is our guest on Investing with IBD, sponsored by MarketSmith. Okay, Jay, let's talk about some of the larger trends and how you're taking advantage of this or how Global X is taking advantage of this with the thematic investing. Sure. Well, first of all, the way we think about thematic investing is it's the process of identifying powerful macro level trends that are disrupting the global economy. And then what are the companies that stand to benefit from the materialization of those trends? So if you think about it, it's really kind of a two-step process. From the top down, we're saying, you know, what are the biggest trends in the world right now? What is, what is going to be moving markets and changing the economy going forward? And then from the bottom up, it's that identification of, you know, what are these companies that are really well positioned? And we've done a lot of work on trying to, you know, identify what those themes are. Uh, we've actually looked at, you know, all the different banks. We've looked at all the different consulting firms, you know, futurist think tanks and things like that. Mm-hmm. And we've come up with what we call the thematic universe, which is actually about 65 to 70 themes. 
And we haven't brought those all out in an ETF because we run those themes through a three-step process to identify, you know, which are really what we think are the best and most investable themes going forward. So that process is, first we look at conviction. So if we're, if we're evaluating a theme, we look at if it's a technology theme, what is the state of the technology? Is it already proven or is it still, you know, very much in a lab being developed? Mm -hmm. Is there a path to profitability for that technology? Is it disrupting an existing technology or is it creating an entirely new field? Uh, if it is already being sold, how much has already been adopted? So we look at adoption curves, which means what is the total addressable market and how much of that addressable market has already been penetrated. Okay. So we take into account all of these different uh, pieces, really trying to you know, put together the puzzle of how much conviction do we have behind that theme? Some themes, you know, we have unlimited conviction. And I mean, if we look at something like robotics and artificial intelligence, there is no question in my mind that robotics is only going to continue to grow going forward. That doesn't mean the stock prices are ne necessarily going to go straight up. But if you look at robotics as a product, there's going to be more robotics being sold 10 years from now than there is today because the technology is getting better, because there's more demand for it, because it's getting cheaper. There's a variety of different drivers that gives us so much conviction behind a theme like that. Now, with robotics, uh, how early did you catch on that theme? Because robotics has, the idea of robotics really changing the world has been around for a while. And Intuitive Surgical, back like in 2004, I think that's when they went public. They were kind of the, that first major company uh, to really show how it can impact the, the medical world. How early in this kind of macro uh, level where you're where you're looking down from the top down approach. Are you catching uh, Are you catching this trend? Are, are you waiting for like a decade to see a few of those innovative companies start to really prove it, or are you are you catching it earlier than that? Well, the, there's kind of like three stages to this. So the first stage I would say is what well, is kind of more the venture capital phase. So you know, a company that is working on a moonshot technology that we've never seen before and sounds amazing, but we have no idea if it works that's going to be more of a venture capital investment, very high risk, very, you know, potential high return if it works out. Yeah. Um, but the reality is these are small companies, they're bootstrapped, they're very unlikely to be publicly listed. Um, and so that, you know, that really kind of fits more in the venture capital part of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum are just industries. So once a theme is fully played out and it's fully penetrated, it just looks like an industry at that point, you know, look at, railroads you know at this point 100 years ago railroads was a theme you know telecoms yeah. theme. now it's just an industry at, at best it's being disrupted yeah. by the new themes so there's a middle ground between those two extremes that we think thematic investing really fits in it's where the adoption has already started to prove itself the companies are going public so that we can invest in them from an etf perspective but there's still a lot of growth left on the table so specifically if we look at robotics it is a very long-term theme. The first robotics companies came out in the 1970s in the automobile industry. And these are really basic robots. They picked up pieces of sheet metal on one in one place and they put them down in another place. That was it. There's no intelligence to these robots. There's very little dexterity to these robots. They just pick stuff up and put it down somewhere else. You look at what we have today and we have incredibly capable robots that are able to work within millimeter increments that can sense when a human is nearby and slow down their motions so the arm doesn't just swing and hit a human in the head. Um, they can identify different objects that are you know, randomly assorted in the pile and able to pick out that object. That's a problem solving issue that, that actually took many years to figure out. So we've come a very far away in robotics since those original pick and place robots in the 70s. But in terms of penetration, how many robots are there out there? Um, one of the measures we look at is number of robots per manufacturing worker. So how many industrial robots are there in the world per manufacturing? In theory, you could have uh, infinite. You could have, you know, you could have 100 robots to every one worker if it was, you know, very automated factory. Right. right now, it's actually the inverse. There's one robot for every 100 manufacturing workers. So it's a 1% penetration globally. The U.S. is a little bit ahead at 2%. You know, very advanced economies in robotics like Singapore and South Korea are at about 8%. But that shows us we're still very early in the adoption for many for robotics. Um, you know, when we just, you know, kind of look at the state of that technology. And that's in the most developed aspect of robotics, which is industrial automation. Other areas like using robots in healthcare and hospitality, autonomous vehicles, 
the adoption is even earlier. So, okay, so so you, you've developed some conviction in the robotics. What's what's the, the next step in the process? Sure, so the, the, that's right. The first step is conviction. The second step is investability. So yeah, at Global X, we're creating exchange-traded funds, ETFs. They have to invest in publicly traded companies. We can't go into the private markets. There's also another regulatory requirement that we have to have 20 names, 20 companies in the fund. We would really prefer 25 to 30, giving us, a, you know, at a minimum, just to give us a little bit more flexibility and a little more diversification. But the most important thing is we want those names to be pure play names on these themes. So if you're saying this is a robotics and artificial intelligence ETF, we want to invest in companies that are deriving the majority of their revenue from robotics or AI, or are at least extremely critical to the space. So when you have that high bar for investability, a lot of themes that are being talked about just don't really, you know, make it. Um, you know, so for example, you know, when we look at blockchain technology, mm-hmm. blockchain, you know, meets the conviction test. It's a, it's an incredible new technology. There's a lot of applications for it, but when you go to the investability criteria, it's still very clear that blockchain is very much in the venture capital or private equity space. It is not in the public equity space yet in terms of having pure play, you know, 20 to five, 25 to 30 pure play companies that you can put in ETF for blockchain exposure. So how soon, like, so blockchain, I think is a great ex- uh, example because everyone's been hearing about, about it and, you know, everyone is wondering how, how, how you invest in something like this. So at this point where, where we are with blockchain, where it's more in the VC kind of world, uh, yeah, how, how, how far out could it be? before you start to see more competitors or more entrants into the, the public markets come enabling you to build an ETF around it? Is there some kind of general kind of time frame that you guys look at or, or just have kind of just more intuition? I would say it, it, it depends. Um, yeah. You know, things can happen quickly. I mean, right now we're seeing a very accelerated IPO market. We've seen a lot of artificial intelligence companies just file for, uh, for IPOs. We've seen a lot of driverless car and electric vehicle companies just file for IPOs. Yeah. So, you know, you can see in a given year, five, maybe even 10 companies IPO if it really, uh, if the conditions are really right. So, you know, it could be a couple of years. I think realistically for blockchain, uh, it's a very fragmented uh, space right now. You haven't seen the true companies really emerge. Uh, you know, you, you kind of need that big name to IPO and see the venture capitalists cash out for other people to follow. So I think we're still going to be a little bit ways away before you see, you know, a huge wave of, you know, 10 blockchain companies all IPOing, you know, at a similar time. Okay, so 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 we we've gone through two parts of the process. So what, what's the third step in the in the the process uh, that that you guys do in uh, Global X? So once we've screened for conviction and then we've screened for investability, the third step is time horizon. So you know we're doing all this research around the theme. We're trying to identify the companies that stand to benefit from the theme. We launch the ETF. We talk about the ETF we don't want to have an experience where suddenly that theme is played out three months later. You know, ideally what we want is that theme is going to play out over decades, if not be almost evergreen in nature, because what that means is it really takes the importance of timing the trade out of the theme. And it's more about just getting exposure to it and holding on for a long time horizon. You know, another example of, you know, some themes that didn't really uh, make it off the chopping block was, um, uh, uh, was trade wars. Uh, you know, last year, all people wanted to talk about was the trade wars, U.S.-China trade wars, U.S.-Europe trade wars, U.S.-NAFTA. All of these trade wars were, you know, or, or rising trade tensions were occurring around the world. And, you know, over, you know, over the course of a few months, the U.S. and China were able to hammer out a phase one trade deal. That doesn't mean it's the end of, you know, trade disputes. You know, clearly there's still rising geopolitical tensions between the U.S. and China. But it makes it very hard to create a, you know, to create a long-term time horizon for a theme like that when it's there's nothing necessarily inherently structural about it that makes us think this is going to continue for the next 20 years. It could end if the political environment, if the social environment, if the economic environment changes pretty quickly, trade wars could be over. And that's something that we're just not very comfortable providing a thematic exposure to because we don't think it's great for investors to have that uncertain time horizon. What about uh, some technology like augmented reality or, or virtual reality? You know, we have Facebook with the the Oculus, uh, which is mind blowing when when you when you try that, uh, and you, when you see some of these other uh, videos out there with with the the augmented reality using their phones and 
uh, being able to see how furniture would look in your uh, place. Uh, what, what, but that theme doesn't seem to have taken off just yet, or it's, it seems like it's at least uh, slowing down at least, right? Or, or just not, it's going in fits and spurts right now. Um, how, how do you guys handle something like that? That's a great question. So augmented and virtual reality certainly is something we've had our eye on for a few years. And where we've struggled with is conviction. You know, a lot of these technologies are still a little bit unproven. Um, you know, if you put an Oculus headset on, it doesn't feel great after about 20 minutes. You can right. feel easy. It's a heavy product. But graphics aren't that great. They can't really figure out if they should be doing processing, uh, you know, within the headset or should it be streamed over the cloud via, you know, faster internet. Uh, the number of apps that are available on those platforms is very limited. I was just looking into this. Microsoft HoloLens has less than 500 apps on their platform. Yeah. Roku has 4,500 channels, and the Apple and the Apple App Store has 2.2 million apps. So 500 is nothing compared to these other platforms that have been very successful. And that's a real problem for the technology because it shows, you know, that when you when when you're trying to open a new environment, a new app environment that people can contribute content to and contribute applications to, and no one's really doing it, that means there's something's, something's wrong. Either there's not enough opportunity yet, or the technology isn't there, or it's too expensive. Um, and then from an investability perspective as well, I mean, there's still questions around it, uh, you know, just in terms of are there enough publicly traded companies? So we have questions about conviction and we have questions about time horizon. That's made us very hesitant to create a standalone ETF trying to target augmented and virtual reality. However, you know, some companies still might have a little bit of exposure to it that we're targeting through other themes. So we have a video games and esports theme. A lot of those companies are experimenting with augmented and virtual reality. I would just caveat that it's a very small portion of those companies' revenues or even R&D budget. So, you know, sometimes these themes kind of are, are intertwined with each other. And video games and esports is is oftentimes kind of the the bigger theme that augmented and virtual reality kind of settles into below it. Yeah, I, I think esports is another one that everyone was really excited about a few years ago, and it and it slowly keeps growing and growing, but it hasn't really taken off like everyone was anticipating uh, three years ago or so. Well, it, it it that had been the case. I mean, it it was growing very quickly, but it's you know small numbers, right? So getting a few thousand more viewers can show huge percentage growth, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's ready to compete with the NFL yet. But what we did see during COVID-19 was a lot of people actually accelerated that movement into esports. That makes sense. So just thinking about, you know, your life back in March and April, if you lived in New York, like myself, it was cold, it was dark, we couldn't go outside, there was no live sports, there was no new shows coming out, there was very little to do. And what you saw was a lot of sports uh, organizations started experimenting with esports. You had NBA players playing each other in NBA 2K20. Uh, you had F1 athletes racing each other in a video game. You had soccer players playing each other in FIFA. And suddenly you had a lot of people who literally would have watched a darts game because there's no competition <laughs> to watch. We're like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll watch Kevin Durant play NBA 2K20. Like, I don't know if he's a good video game player, but I kind of just want to see him and hear him and see what it's like. You know, maybe yeah. he has, you know, maybe he has some incredible skill set that I've never seen before. So a lot of people got drawn into those competitions that never really considered esports before. And look, some of those people, maybe it wasn't for them. They're not interested. They're not going to do it again when live sports, you know, now that live sports are back, they're back to live sports. But a percentage of those people that experimented with esports um, during that period are going to stick with it, and their friends are going to stick with it, and they're going to keep talking about it, and they're going to follow the players in video games, and they're buying the video games themselves, and they're keeping up with it. So COVID-19 really created a disruptive environment for esports in a positive way because it brought all these people into the ecosystem that are now going to continue to use it and continue to be evangelists for it amongst their friend groups. Uh, as people are looking for things to do and, and ways to spend their leisure time. Oh, that's excellent. Uh, so understanding and investing in larger trends in the market can make a big impact in your portfolio. And so always pay attention to them and look for catalysts, even sometimes extreme catalysts like COVID-19. Coming up next, we will discuss a few ideas. Stay tuned. 
Market Smith will give you a huge edge in the stock market. Better stocks, bigger profits. Market Smith is the top research platform for IBD. It's just the best tool for individual stock selection. Everything within Market Smith is designed to bring those best stocks to the surface. It does a lot of the work for you of filtering down to the potential leaders. It's when you take the training wheels off and you're ready to invest on a more professional level. Market Smith will help you take control of your investment life. If you want to get serious about investing, start your membership today. We are back with Jake Jacobs on Investing with IBD, sponsored by MarketSmith. Okay, Jay, let's get into a few ideas here. And I think the best thing to do, and you mentioned this earlier in the episode, the reopening of the economy, right? Where now obviously things are, are, are changed and a lot of things have been permanently changed. Uh, but talk about a little bit about this theme and then we can go into some of the, 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 the winners of, of all these changes and some of the ETFs that Global X has uh, created and that are uh, doing well as a result of this uh, pretty big catalyst. Sure. Yeah, as, as we talked about before, you know, this is an uncharted territory for us. We're trying to reopen the economy across a lot of different companies, organizations, and it's, it's unknown. We're trying to open schools and see what happens when you put a thousand kids in the school uh, that may or may not be uh, socially distant or wearing masks. What happens when you bring dozens or hundreds or thousands of people back to corporate campuses or we reopen department stores without windows and air filtration? So a lot of these things are still very uncharted. And our overarching theme around the reopening economy is that companies that can enable flexibility in the reopening or can offer safety and assurances uh, during the reopening are really good, well positioned because when we look at flexibility, the reopening of the economy is not going to be a linear process. There's going to be two steps forward, one step back. There might be some outbreaks. There might be some concerns. There might be changing regulations and companies that can help facilitate that flexibility in the reopening are just going to be so well positioned. And then in the safety side, Companies don't want to take on liability of opening up their their offices and not have uh, you know and, and not be testing for COVID or being able to identify if someone gets COVID very quickly and endangering their employees. Schools don't want to do that. Governments don't want to do that. So there's going to be a huge emphasis on safety. Some of these names have already been you know a focus for the last few months during uh, during this whole pandemic, but you know might be really set to enter the next phase as it's not just about you know, testing and treating and sensing people who are already sick, but the entire population of 330 million people in the US and 7 billion people around the world. Okay, Jay, so let's get into the, the first ETF here. And this is based around telemedicine and the ticker, uh, it's EDOC, the ticker symbol is E-D-O-C. Yeah, so we launched a telemedicine ETF about a month ago, uh, eDoc. It already has uh, almost 300 million in assets under management. Wow. And the idea is how do we provide exposure to companies uh, that are leading in telemedicine and digital health? So telemedicine is this uh, concept of connecting remotely patients to doctors. And there's a lot of reasons why this makes a lot of sense. So first of all, convenience. You just don't have to leave your house, get in your car, park at the clinic, go see your doctor. That can be a multi-hour process. You know, why not schedule uh, a telemedicine visit and in half an hour you're done. But secondly, during COVID-19 and why this has become so important is because of safety. Entering into a health clinic or a hospital suddenly exposes you to a lot of the germs or viruses that are in that place. So a lot of doctors were saying, don't come in. Uh, if we can do this remotely, this would be so much safer for you uh, and it's going to be a better experience. So that really, you know, formed a huge catalyst for telemedicine to be adopted much more broadly. Uh, but then the third reason is better outcomes. So it's not just about, you know, video chatting with your doctor. There's actually a lot of things that can be done remotely around monitoring your health, uh, whether you're, you know, wearing a wearable that is transmitting information and collecting information for your doctor. Uh, or now there's even pills that can be taken that can monitor your compliance with certain um, uh, uh, drug regimen so that doctors aren't just prescribing you a drug, they know how much you're taking, which is actually a huge um, difference in trying to understand the eth efficacy of those drugs because sometimes people just don't adhere to those regimens very well. So when you combine those aspects, you see phenomenal growth in telemedicine. Uh, some people are, are measuring 50 to 150 times increases in telemedicine since the beginning of the pandemic. Wow. 
That's basically because providers before the pandemic really didn't have an incentive to do, to offer telemedicine, or maybe they had it, but it just wasn't going to be a key focus. Now it is a key focus of those, uh, of those providers. And, you know, if not a default setting for how to provide care in this environment. What about uh, digital records? You know, obviously, I mean, I, when I started in college years ago, I, I worked in the medical world and uh, there were papers everywhere. And that didn't really change for many years. Is that part of this ETF or is that another theme uh, of, of uh, this transition from paper to electronics in the medical world? It is. So that's another component of the theme beyond just, um, you know, telemedicine companies is companies that are aggregating data in the healthcare world. So a lot, elect electronic medical records are now um, a requirement in a lot of OECD countries. There's a lot of electronic medical records being produced. The problem is they're not very well organized or utilized. Um, so from an input perspective, do the nurses and the doctors understand how to input data correctly? Is it being replicated? Is that information being shared with patients so that they can double check their medical records? Can patients update it themselves? And is it being shared across provider networks? So maybe you went to a clinic in New York City and you've now moved to the suburbs and you're seeing a different doctor. Are they sharing those records effectively? All of these things are frankly are just not being done very well right now. And so there's a lot of companies that are coming into the space trying to do a better job aggregating that data and analyzing that data so it's more useful. And then, you know, just think about the reams and reams of doctor's notes that are, you know, oh, gosh, yeah. over from the past that are kind of useless um, as they're stored in one physical location. Can you find a way to use artificial intelligence to convert that to digital text and then upload that into your electronic medical record? That's a little bit of the holy grail here, and there's a lot of companies working on that as well, so that suddenly you can take all these non-digital records and digitize them. Perfect. Let's go to another theme, and this is the Internet of Things, uh, and you have an ETF. The ticker symbol is SNSR, and now here's another theme that I've been hearing about for years and years, and it, and it just <laughs> seems to be just slowly growing and growing, but it never really exploded at, at least at least to me it hasn't but uh talk about this etf and and what what you guys are looking for with this theme sure well the internet of things is really about taking devices or objects and connecting to them to the internet so uh, a fun example i like to talk about is the light bulb um, for 200 years the light bulb existed and basically had one feature which was on and off over those 200 years you know light bulbs began lasting longer, but they became more energy efficient, but their utility was still turn on the light or turn off the light. Once you put a chip into a light bulb, it can start to do all kinds of different things. So it connects to the internet and because it connects to the internet, it can connect to your phone. So from your phone, you can remotely turn it on and on, off and on that light. So if you're sitting in bed, you realize you left the kitchen light on, you can turn that off. Or if you're traveling and you, you, know, you wanna show like there's someone in your house, you can turn it on and off. But more sophisticated than that, um, now that it has a chip in it, the, uh, the, the light bulb can be connected to other devices. So if you want to connect it to your alarm so that the light turns on when you're waking up at seven in the morning, now you can do that. Or if you have a security camera, you want a light to turn on whenever the security camera is sensing motion, then you can do that because there are now all those are integrated on the internet. Or the light bulb can now sense its usage, it can track efficiency, it can give you tips on you know, how to use it less or more, or it's a, it is now a smart light bulb. And it yeah. is not just being able to be controlled, but it's able to be integrated and to generate insights. And you take a very simple device and suddenly it has so many different use cases or so many different uh, features now uh, from it. So that's just the most basic example, but you can extend that to so many different devices now in our homes, uh, with smart appliances in our cars, with smart cars, with buildings that are now being smarter so that they can get better about energy efficiency and, and uh, climate control and things like that. So we're seeing a huge expansion of the internet of things now, uh, you know, beyond the utility of it. Uh, first, we're seeing chips are getting cheaper. Uh, so we looked into the original Wi-Fi chip uh, that came out in 2007 in your iPhone uh, cost about seven and a half dollars to produce. Okay. Now that same chip is about 10 cents. So oh, you've had 99% wow. deflation in a chip. It's not the best chip in the world. It's, it's 13 years old, but it connected things to the internet and it still can. So if you have a 10 cent chip uh, that is also one tenth of the size of a dime, 
you can start putting that in pretty much anything um, if it has some use case. So we're really seeing that all these different devices are being connected to the internet because it's cheap and it's very doable. And then on top of that, um, you're seeing faster internet and more widespread internet. So in the emerging markets, you know, more and more people are being connected to the internet every day. And in more developed markets, you're seeing uh, the migration from 4G to 5G, which is making the internet faster uh, and have more capacity. More devices are able to connect to, to 5G towers than before. So you have all these different uh, tailwinds that are that are kind of combining here uh, to really launch the Internet of Things in a way that that it, it just hasn't yet seen, but we think it's going to prime it for a very strong uh, next few years here. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Let's go to another theme here, and this is one that we're all familiar with, uh, cloud computing and uh, your ETF. The, the ticker symbol is C-L-O-U. Yeah, so cloud computing has been, you know, essential to the, you know, to this entire stay-at-home economy and will be essential to the reopening economy. Cloud computing is essentially the digital infrastructure that allows you to access data, access applications, access files, wherever you are. You don't have to be in the office anymore. You can be at home and you can be on the road, you can be on your laptop, you can be on your iPad. Cloud computing enables all of that in the background. So what you saw you know, at the beginning of, of COVID-19 was suddenly a lot of companies that had already been adopting you know, cloud applications uh, in the past were suddenly you know, really rapidly adopting every cloud uh, software they could to be able to continue to facilitate their business operations. Um, you know, for example, you know, at Global X, we're a pretty technolo- technologically savvy company, but you know, the day after we started working from home, we got Zoom, we got Slack, we got all right. these different communication right. software uh, packages to be able to you know, keep doing our jobs. And we're certainly not alone in that. Um, so what we see going forward in this reopening economy is cloud is going to continue to be at the center of everything. Because even if people move into their offices, we know it's going to be at low density. You know, A lot of companies are saying you can come into the office, but we can only have 5% or 10% capacity. So 90% of people are still working from home. That 90% is probably going to rotate. People will be in the, in the office, out of the office. And then beyond that, if we do have an outbreak or a scare or a change in regulations, people immediately have to be able to pick up and go back to working from home. So the only way that that flexibility is really possible is if these companies are still using cloud computing technologies to the most of their ability. So this doesn't necessarily mean we're going to see more companies adopting the cloud than before. I think a lot of these companies have already done that adoption over the last you know, six months or so. Mm-hmm. But what it means is cloud is not fireable. You cannot fire a cloud computing company right now. It is very oh, difficult yeah. because we're depending on it and it's integrated into our business operations. When you can't fire a cloud computing company, that means they continue to collect their recurring revenue that's very valuable. And if they even really want to, they can start raising prices. And in the cloud computing space, Raising prices is almost entirely creative to earnings because you build out a software platform. It's a fixed cost when you develop it. And then you try to ship out that software to as many people as possible and charge as much as possible. So if you raise the cost that you're charging your uh, your customer, that software, it doesn't change the cost of providing that software. You've already developed it. You already have the programmers. So these cloud computing companies have a lot of pricing power. Yep. And we think, we think of what we've seen is a lot of these cloud computing companies effectively kind of cut a lot of deals during COVID-19 at very low at very low costs for clients to adopt it. As things start to normalize, those cloud computing companies are going to say, hey, we gave you a pretty good deal here. We have to spend <laughs> cost on you to get it back to normal. And that's going to be really, really strong for earnings, as we saw with, with Salesforce today, which had yep. uh, which had 20% or 29% revenue growth. 118% earnings growth on 29% revenue growth. That's because of that operational leverage when you have fixed costs. Uh, and, I mean, yeah, the, the Salesforce numbers was mind boggling and the reaction uh, to those earnings was, was just incredible for such a large company. Uh, let's end with one more theme. And this is uh, another one that everyone's always curious about, uh, genomics and, and uh, the ticker symbol for this uh, and the global XETF is GNOM. Yeah, so genomics has been there from the beginning uh, with COVID-19. Um, the first thing that people had to do, that researchers had to do when COVID-19 started to be measured, uh, was to uh, to sequence the genome of the virus. And they were able to do that with 
within two weeks of first discovering it. Uh, when you go back to SARS, the SARS outbreak in 2002 and 2003, it took them six months. So from six months to two weeks, when you're able to sequence the genome, suddenly you can do all the other things that you want to do to treat COVID-19. So now you know what the virus looks like. You can create the tests that take biosamples from people, look at those biosamples and compare it to the genome that you saw from the virus when you sequenced it. So you can now really start to scale testing because you know what you're looking for. Once you scale that testing, then you can start to develop treatments. So there's basically these large repositories of, uh, of all these different um, uh, drugs that are already out there, already approved by the FDA. And what they're trying to do computationally is say, we know what the virus looks like. So now that we know what the virus looks like, let's try to model what all these existing drugs might do to that virus. And when you run that through that computer program, that's how you start to identify potential off-the-shelf treatments that can be used immediately. That's a much faster path towards treatment than trying to develop something new from the ground up. So we've heard a lot about remdesivir. We've heard about hydrochloroquine. We've heard like these different types of drugs are being floated out there as, hey, maybe yeah. these work. A lot of that was actually coming from those computational analyses that they're able to identify maybe these drugs will work. Then you have to do human trials. You have to understand, you know, does this actually work? But you're able to go from the thousands of drugs that are out there to, you know, to a few possible candidates that could treat it immediately. And then beyond that, the holy grail is the vaccine. A lot of creating the vaccine is going to be done based off of the modeling of, uh, of the genome of the virus that we already have and trying to computationally understand what the vaccine might do in the human body to this virus and to, um, uh, and to you know, the ailments that come with that virus. You want to do as much as you can in that computer environment before going to human trials. And so that's where genomics and the genomic sequencing and all this data we've been collecting really comes into play um, uh, for this theme. But then looking forward, and the reason why we think this is still very relevant to the reopening economy is that um, we think testing is going to just be scaled exponentially going forward. Um, you know, we know testing has been, you know, huge for the last few months, and there's been a lot of you know, gains in, in the availability of testing and turnarounds of testing. But what we're starting to see now is to create a safe environment is that a lot of organizations are trying to test on a constant basis. You know, if you know that you have a known population of 100 employees and you test those employees every two weeks, what it means is you have a very good chance of identifying if one of those employees has, has COVID and you can quarantine that employee, hopefully before they've gotten in contact with the other 99 employees of that company. It creates a much safer environment. It reduces the risk for those businesses of reopening. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's relatively doable. You know, people have taken these tests. They, they work pretty well. So it's a, it's a relatively easy way that these companies can move closer towards reopening, but doing it in a safe and responsible way. But it will require a massive scale in the availability of these tests. And there's a lot of companies held in our, in our genomics ETF that are really at the center of, of developing those, uh, those tests for, uh, for COVID-19. Oh, that, that's uh, really, really fascinating. Uh, so there are a few ideas that are worth considering adding to your watch list. Thanks, Jay, for joining us today. Thank you. Next week, we will have Steve Birch returning back to the show. Steve is the CEO of William O'Neill and Company and O'Neill Global Advisors. So that's it for this week on Investing with IBD. I'm Arusha Pires, and thanks for listening. <laughs>